Hey everyone, it's Alan Brockstein from New Cannabis Ventures and 420 Investor here with your weekly update. Uh, it's just more of the same. Every week, uh, it seems like we're going lower and lower. <clears throat> I know a lot of people are uh, looking forward to a new year, hopefully a new change in the trend. Uh, this week, the market fell, I think, about 5.5%. Uh, this included a little rally on Friday, so Thursday. It set a new 52-week low. Uh, Weakness abounded. There was no shortage of it. Uh, Friday's strength was uh, really driven primarily by uh, the Can Canadian LPs, the large ones, had a pretty big bounce. Uh, it has been a very long 10 months since February. Uh, it's been literally 10 months since the market peaked. Uh, again, tax law selling, window dressing, hedge funds on the sideline. These are all things that could continue to... Uh, impact market prices over the next few uh, ten, 10 trading sessions or nine, nine trading sessions is what's left. So uh, with that said, uh, there was a lot of news last week for uh, December as the month, uh, as the year draws to a end. And uh, we publish uh, various types of uh, press releases. They tend to be either um, related to M&A, uh, to financing or to financial reports. And we had examples of all of that this week, uh, the most of them important of which made it to the newsletter. So the first one, uh, I'll hit all the M&A type stuff. Uh, the first one was kind of a surprise, maybe not. Uh, Canopy Growth uh, divested its German pharmaceutical operations. Uh, this is going to diminish their revenue rather significantly, by the way. Um, the, uh, while they haven't grown uh, sales there since they acquired that in 2019, uh, it is a reasonable amount of revenue that will go by the wayside. This is a unit that <coughs> sells uh, both uh, uh, synthetic and cannabis-derived uh, medications in Germany, and uh, they've uh, divested it. Uh, the price that they're selling at is less than half of what they bought it for uh, two and a half years ago, uh, but it has an earnout in it. E even if they get 100% of that, it'll be no more than about 52% of what they paid. So uh, just going a little bit deeper on this one, obviously this wasn't in the press release, but why? Why are they doing this? Well, first of all, this was in the press release. Uh, they mentioned some sort of $50 million expense they were gonna have to absorb due to so some restructuring issue. I was like, wow, they never talked about that. So part of the reason for the sales to avoid spending precious cash, but that gets to the second part. I, I'm on the record as saying that I have been expecting Canopy Growth's debt to be in excess of its cash as of 1231. Uh, I'm going to back off that because they're getting in the cash from this. So, But I think that's what's driving it. A little bit of a cash crunch at Canopy Growth as they've been borrowing uh, more and more money and spending it either through their operations or, for instance, the WANA option. So that was uh, the first piece of uh, M&A news. The second one, kind of interesting, uh, Innovative Industrial Properties, the, the REIT, uh, bought a portfolio of assets uh, across, I believe, four states, primarily in Colorado. Uh, and uh, they expanded their relationships with, you know, mo most of these uh, entities on the other side of the sale leaseback were already customers of IIPR, but they also added uh, one or two new ones as well. And so this has been one of the big stories uh, this year, the increasing availability of sale leasebacks and IIPRs uh, been able to access a lot of capital. And uh, this, I guess, was a way for them to... Uh, bulk up their portfolio uh, in, in an easy way by instead of signing new sale leasebacks, uh, looking at an existing portfolio and adding. Uh, in terms of capital raises, uh, I'm happy to say nobody's selling stock, uh, that's for sure. Prices are low and they're not selling stock. Uh, we saw the best debt deal uh, in the market to date, and that was Cureleaf. Uh, borrowing $425 million at 8% for five years. There were no equity kickers or anything like that. Uh, truly a uh, uh, 
uh, something, an accomplishment to be proud of for the company and the industry. Uh, this has been a recurring theme this year. I'll get back to that in just a moment. But uh, the importance of this is that they can uh, fund their expansions. They're using part of it to pay off some higher cost debt, but they can, uh, on the balance, they can use it to uh, fund uh, high return on investment capital projects without issuing equity. Uh, and I think it reflects very positively on not only the company, but the industry. Uh, additionally, Glasshouse uh, was able to raise $100 million in debt uh, to help build out their big California project, like it or not. Some people are not uh, excited about that. Some people are real excited. But uh, it was a big question mark. Uh, I personally was a little surprised the stock didn't do better on the announcement. Uh, it is very important. Uh, the company bought this asset and needs to develop it, but maybe it reflects just the weakness in the overall California market and the concerns of some that this project's uh, not going to fare well. Uh, I'm not going to share my opinion. I'm just telling you what some people say. Uh, the third capital raising news item uh, was uh, uh, tag team. AFC Gamma and recently public Chicago Atlantic teamed up uh, to lead a $150 million uh, debt deal for acreage. And uh, again, another example of debt capital becoming available. Uh, and then finally, Valens, uh, uh, Kenny LP uh, borrowed uh, $40 million at 10% for two years. Uh, it kind of struck me as expensive, uh, short-term and expensive. And when I'm looking at some of these American deals, uh, wow, you know, they're federally illegal and they're getting better terms. But I, I think there was a very important line in the press release regarding this takes away the need to raise uh, equity capital, which I think uh, had been possibly weighing on the stock. Uh, so it took a day or two for the stock to respond to that, but uh, it, it was up a lot Friday in a better tape, but down on that news Thursday. All right, the third type of news, as I mentioned, uh, financial reports. We had uh, two of those this week, Fire and Flower and Hexo, two of the highest revenue generators in the Canadian market. Of course, High Tide, I'm sorry, that's High Tide. Of course, Fire and Flower doesn't get it all from the Canadian market. They uh, are able to get uh, generate revenue in the United States now uh, to a limited degree through uh, the sale of uh, their uh, software in te data technology, data services. So uh, that was just a small part uh, of their growth. So uh, their revenue increased 37% from a year ago to uh, 45.4 million. Uh, wholesale and digital were very strong, while retail for the second quarter in a row showed negative same store sales. This is similar to what competitor High Tide has shown uh, and reflects a really challenging retail environment in Canada right now due to the abundance of deep discounters at the retail level. Uh, so that was uh, 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 one report. Then the other one, Hexo uh, missed by a little bit on their, both on the revenue and on the adjusted EBITDA. Uh, I think this story is less about their current near-term finances than it is about resolving their pretty tremendous debt challenge right now. Uh, there was a lot of dilution during quarter is their convertible note holder converted out some of the debt, but there's still a lot. And this is a toxic note. And so the lower price uh, means more shares and it's, it's a death spiral type of situation. So I read the transcript and uh, this is obviously uh, top of mind for the company. There was a lot more in that news release than just the financials if you want to read it. Uh, we also publish exclusive news at New Canvas Ventures. We were kind of light this week. Normally we'll have two uh, interviews. And we had just one this week. It was a Humble and Fume, and this is a relatively new company, full disclosure, uh, new company to the public markets, I should say, not a new company. Uh, and full disclosure, they're a client of New Canvas Ventures. I have found this company over the years to be intriguing. Uh, historically, uh, they've been an ancillary distribution company. Uh, they sell 
uh, ancillary products, uh, you know, consumables, and vape, you know, vaping devices, things like that. And in Canada, over the last few years, they have be become a cannabis distributor of sorts. They represent cannabis companies at the retail stores. So rather than have their own salespeople going out to visit all the stores across the country, so Fire and Flower, I'm sorry, not Fire and Flower, Humble and Fume is already making those sales calls for the ancillary products, and they uh, have added cannabis. So in the United States, they've had a, a very large business uh, in the ancillary part of the market, and they recently uh, announced a deal with an alcohol distributor where that company's investing into another vehicle, and that money uh, gets invested uh, indirectly then into uh, Humble and Fume, which is going to be entering the California cannabis distribution market. So uh, becoming a distributor of cannabis and uh, a very interesting story. So we caught up with the CEO in this interview, Joel Taguri. He was at Afria uh, and then uh, at Supreme. And uh, it, it was an a interesting interview. You can listen to that uh, or read, you know, if you don't have time to listen to the whole interview, which I believe was about 15 or 16 minutes. Uh, we have a write-up as well, obviously. Uh, so just to, to wrap it up, each week we share kind of uh, some perspective on the cannabis market. And I think one of the things I try to do in this is to point out e either things to look for in the future or things that people might be missing right now. And I think people may be missing something right now, and that's the topic this week, which is, uh, ties back to that Cure Leaf debt deal. This has been one of the big stories this year. So I, I talked about how we've seen improving terms, meaning lower interest rates, as well as longer maturities for the leading American cannabis companies. And so they are, they've taken on some debt in the piece. I kind of contrast the situation with Canada several years ago, which bit many of these companies in the butt. I would venture to say all of them. And it's a totally different situation as I talk about in this piece. The debt that was issued in Canada was very speculative. The companies didn't have a lot of revenue, and if they did have revenue, they didn't have uh, positive EBITDA. And uh, so uh, the, the history's there. You can go back and look and see what happened uh, with this debt. It was pretty nasty. Uh, the best example is Supreme Cannabis. It was like a $2 convertible that they ended up renegotiating and converting it at 20 cents. It was terrible, massive dilution. So uh, I talked about how this is favorable. I, I don't want people to think that there's just one side uh, of that sword. It's a two-edged sword. Taking on debt always has risk. So I talked about that as well. So uh, that's where uh, we are in our newsletter tomorrow. Uh, there's a link in this, uh, in this video. Uh, you can click to sign up for that newsletter. We also publish it uh, to the website if you just want to come and visit uh, occasionally. But uh, that's uh, really the only place where we get editorial on New Cannabis Ventures. Uh, beyond that, it's just facts and figures, not editorial. So uh, with that, I know a lot of people will be uh, taking uh, holiday vacation time or taking some time off. And this is the last video before Christmas. So I want to wish everybody a, a Merry Christmas and Happy Boxing Day. And, uh, of course, I'll be back uh, next weekend uh, on Christmas Day for, uh, uh, I guess, what will be the last uh, video of the year. I've been doing these since uh, September. I appreciate uh, the feedback that I've gotten, and I do uh, anticipate continuing to do, to do these into the new year. Take care, everybody.